Good evening, everybody. Welcome to That's Wild. Hello everybody, very very excited to have you all with us tonight on That's Wild. We have an incredible show for you this evening. I'm very very excited to let you all know that we have a very wonderful man that has come to join us tonight by the name of Carl Middleton. Carl is from the Mabula Ground Hornbill Project. Carl, good evening, welcome, good nice evening. to have you. Thanks for having me, good evening everyone. My name is Carl, I'm the Senior Coordinator for Mabula Ground Hornbill Project and yeah, I'm excited to chat to you about everything ground hornbill tonight. Yeah, it's uh, a very exciting show, everybody. I've certainly been excited for this one. Um, I haven't seen Carl in quite a while, um, but I know that he's been up to some incredible work over the last couple of years. Carl, how long have you been working with ground hornbills? Uh, for the past seven and a half years now, so I've had a good stint with, with the ground hornbills. Um, Amazing. Yeah, it's been good. And, and where, did it, where did it all start for you? How, how did you get into this? What, what drove you to focus on hornbills, ground hornbills specifically? It started by pure chance actually. I was kind of, I studied at university and I was kind of looking for some kind of position and I just heard that previous researchers for the ground hornbill project were, were kind of leaving. So literally drove to their door and I said, what's happening with this project? I would love to be involved and it kind of, it happened. And it's, amazing, it's been yeah. yeah seven and a half years now and going strong so it's been very exciting yeah geez, and i'll tell you what you must clearly love what you're doing because i know how hard it is to keep track of these birds and it takes a lot of dedication a lot of time on the road and a, and a frustrating process because we know how slow everything moves with ground hornbills it's glacial. Um, yeah, yeah glacial exactly yeah. you said it earlier um tell me what what what's been going on recently what is, what is uh, happening in terms of the conservation of birds specifically in this area surrounding the Kruger National Park? It's been really exciting. I mean, Mabula Ground Hornbill Project has been going for 24 odd years now. Okay. And it's really, you know, it's, it's been snowballing and things are really, really going well so far and we, we're just going to take it to the next level now, I think. Um, luckily, we have some, had some great success in this area with birds breeding. So we just want to kind of you know carry on with that see if we can get birds to continue to breed successfully and then just naturally expand into new areas and repopulate areas that they've kind of just disappeared from okay yeah amazing that's very cool mm. all right everybody so uh before we get right down into the nitty-gritty of what carl does in his work we're going to quickly go into the highlights of the week a very exciting week that we've had here at painted dog on the respray game reserve so we're going to quickly get into that everyone well sorry just busy checking something in my pocket so going straight into the first clip you'll see this amazing footage of a drive that i was on recently this is a scene that's not for the sensitive viewer uh pretty damn amazing stuff though that myself and andrew were there to witness so we got the timing right the boma here on the reach break game reserve is currently holding a pack or a dispersal pack of five male wild dogs and uh, we actually arrived we drove past the boma looking for lions in fact and uh, bumped into jakes one of the reserve managers that had just put down a carcass for those wild dogs absolutely amazing look at this car absolutely awesome. okay, crazy so the birds that you've just seen there everybody was a group of yellow-billed kites now i've never seen them group like that before no, never you haven't either never. Hey? i always just see them you know hanging around over the roads waiting for some kind of roadkill to catch so they're amazing birds they're certainly one of my favorites absolute acrobats in the sky and incredible at picking up scraps off the ground without actually having to touch ground which is quite amazing but to see them in a in a flock like that they were attracted to the wild dogs being fed 
uh, it was it was a, a real highlight for the week to see something unique, something that I'd never seen before. Look at how quickly these dogs tap into that carcass. <laughs> yes, they make no, no, they make quick work of that. Eh? Unbelievable. Um, yeah, so just an update on those dogs. They they're doing really well. They're very happy in the boma. Um, obviously, we're still feeding them on a regular basis, and we're still waiting on the results of genetic testing that's been conducted on a group of females on a property quite a bit further north of us that we're hoping to then bring to the Reedsbrake Game Reserve and introduce to this group of males. Uh, I can't wait for awesome. you know for that's that to happen. Stuff, right? It is. It's super exciting, and again, something unique for me, uh, just to see how they actually pair those dogs. I didn't know that they'll actually go and Rush smudge them against each other. <laughs> go yeah. and smudge these wild dogs Madness, up against one another, and 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 that'll hopefully you know pair them together like that. We've of course, Carl had an amazing day. You know, we started this morning with. Uh, what time did we get going? I think it was about 3.30 this morning we hit the road and went up to the Salati Game Reserve. I know there's a lot of people that are watching with us tonight. It is very early. <laughs> yeah, no, trust me, I struggled. I took a couple of cup, cups of coffee before I got going. Um, yeah, so we've had an amazing day, everybody. We, we went up to a game reserve nearby to go and try capture a pack of wild dogs that we're relocating to a new system. Uh, and it was an amazing day. I, I hope you all got to see it. If you haven't seen it, please just tune into Painted Dog. Go straight to the Painted Dog YouTube channel and uh, you'll be able to watch it there. But quite, quite an amazing day. Um, yeah, so it's been a long day. It's been an exciting day. And... Um, it's the bush life this. It, it is, it yeah. is, it is the bush life, as you know, all too yeah. well. Yeah. Uh, but we are very privileged men and women to do what we do. Right, everybody, we're going into our next high life now here. Uh, now, I mentioned, you know, the lionesses uh, might, might come around. This is amazing to see. So we were sitting with the dogs, we watched them feeding, and while I was sitting with Andrew, I said to him, these dogs are making a racket, there's vultures coming in, all of those yellow-billed kites. We were looking for those lionesses when we went past the boma, and look at what happened. They, they picked up on what was going on. Obviously, lionesses have the most remarkable senses. They picked up on the sounds. They, you know, they spotted these birds landing. They knew something was up. And so they came in for a closer look. So absolutely amazing afternoon that we had here at Painted Dog on our game drive. We followed these lionesses. They did a couple of laps around the boma, trying to figure out a way to get in there. Fortunately, that boma is very secure. I can imagine those wild dogs must have been quite on edge knowing that they were around. They didn't get in, however, and eventually gave up and moved on. But certainly quite a highlight for the week. Definitely. Yeah, yeah very, Probably very cool. why they were taking, eating that carcass so quickly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they know all too well those dogs, eh? Absolutely amazing. It was cool to see that bird life that rocked up as Absolutely. well, though. We had some, uh, obviously we saw the kites, we had white-backed vultures turn up, uh, hooded vultures as well. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, very, very, very cool. So going into the next highlight, everybody, um, I think this was one of Andrew's, oh no, this is still me, still me. Look at this, everybody. A pair of Ilant, a rare antelope species for this this part of the world. We don't we don't see them here very often, and they are the remaining two here on the Reedsbrate Game Reserve. Uh, I think at one stage there were actually eight of them in a herd that were reintroduced to the Reedsbrate Game Reserve. There are only two that remain. The lions have made short work of them, but they are really, really awesome to see uh, those two Ilant right at the end of our drive. That was actually just shortly after we had left the Boma, I think. Um, I can't remember the last time I saw an ear lunt. Yeah, you said, you, you saw this footage ages, earlier. Ages. Nice. Pretty yeah. epic, eh? Very cool. Jealous. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking back, you know, when I saw them that, that evening, you know, I think the last time I've seen them in this area was quite easily about 16, 17 years ago on a trip with yeah. my folks in the Kruger Park, yeah. right up in the north. Yeah, in the north, yeah. And just such an amazing antelope to see. Uh, Absolutely. Largest antelope that we have here in this area. Very, very cool. Right, so moving into the next highlight of the week, everybody. Um, this was one of Andrew's drives, and he got up close and personal with the male lions of the Reedsbrake Game Reserve. Awesome shots of them snoozing. <coughs> and uh, I'm just going to stop talking for a moment here, everybody, because I believe the, the team captured them roaring in this particular... Oh, big sneeze there. So yeah, I'm just going to let you all listen in on this particular clip. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> 
Lazy roaring there, eh? Yeah. Just yeah. Parking off on its side, roaring away. Fat and happy male lions. <laughs> Such an incredible sound. You know, I, I never get tired of it. I'm sure you don't either. No, never. It's an amazing thing to be that close to male lions, everybody, or any lions when they're roaring like that. It literally... You is, feel it. You literally yeah. feel it. And you can, yeah. like, feel it in the car. The car almost starts to vibrate ever so slightly when you're that close to them. It's absolutely amazing. So... I highly recommend for those of you who think about maybe coming out here on a safari, trust me, it is an amazing experience, a life-changing experience to get up close with you know, Africa's apex predator there. Mm. Moving into the next clip, uh, again another awesome highlight with Andrew and the elephants I believe was in this particular clip. Andrew, uh, Andrew often gets to have a lot of fun moments with elephants here on the Reed Sprout Game Reserve and as you can see here this is the cheeky young bull that comes right up to say hello to Andrew. Uh, this young elephant bull has become very comfortable with the vehicles and is at an age where he's exploring his boundaries really and showing off his, his massive strength. I just love spending time with these young bulls. You can see Andrew getting quite <laughs> animated there, raising his hand, just letting the bull know that he's there and uh, putting him in his place there, or at least trying to put him in his place there. Good job, Andrew. Very good effort. Uh, but a really cool highlight for the week. Uh, yeah, it's, it's been an amazing week, everybody. I mean, you know, the game drives, uh, the wild dogs that we've been trying to capture, and of course now having Carl with us tonight. It's Never a dull moment. No, no, no it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. We are very, very fortunate to do what we do. All right, everybody, we're going to go to a short ad break. We'll be back with you very soon. Welcome back everybody, very very excited for the next couple of segments now in our show, this is when we get into the meat of our discussion with Kyle, um, Kyle I'll let you lead most of it but tell us what, tell us what your day looks like and what, what's going on at the moment with Mabula and your, your research. Well, this, this time of year is very very busy for us. Um, Ground hornbills are breeding and this is usually our, our time for action. I mean, we are incredibly busy uh, Much to contra a lot of belief that you know when people go to Kruger and things they see ground hornbills all the time And and for that reason they think you know ground hornbills they can't be struggling kind of thing. But in reality yeah. ground hornbills are in serious trouble and we are really Trying to counter this and we're having some huge success. So at the moment we're just trying to go out and see monitor birds, monitor their breeding and see if they are breeding, those kinds of things. Um, it's pretty it's pretty exciting, you know, it's it's one of those fantastic parts of conservation that, that you actually get to deal with. Um, we'll go and we'll check the chicks, we'll make sure that they're all okay, we'll take some measurements. Um, but that's obviously just, you know, that's the exciting side of it. There's the whole background to it that well, I suppose we'll get into now. Sure. Um, yeah, it's a lot, there's a lot more to it. For those, for those of you who don't know all too much about uh, the Southern Ground Hornbills and how endangered they are uh, and how difficult it is for these birds to breed, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about how that works, you know, the breeding of these birds. Um, Absolutely. And, yeah, please I just mean, go we, ahead. We mentioned earlier that everything is, you know, glacial with these birds and it, and it really is so at maximum a ground hornbill group, so they're group living birds, they'll live in 
generally family groups um, and that group will only have a single adult female within each group so five six individuals there'll be one adult female so there can only be one breeding opportunity kind yeah. of thing. so at best they can reproduce once a year per group okay so they they also have massive territories so they don't occur in, in high densities like other species the yeah. territories in this area are about 100 square kilometers so Holy mass, smokes. massive massive areas and compounded with the fact that they extremely long-lived species i mean they live in the wild 50 to 60 years yeah. so even though us as a project have been going for 24 years for a lot of the birds that we monitor we're monitoring the same individuals that's unbelievable so it's and this this longevity that they have also means that they don't they don't have to breed every year mm. like a lot of bo smaller birds that breed every year successively these long-lived species will wait for conditions to be ideal and and then breed when they are ideal so they might skip skip four five six years even before they attempt breeding again which you know if you're trying to increase the numbers in the species it's it's not exactly an easy solution to try and Jeez. solve kind of thing okay. so it's a big challenge their, their life histories definitely don't help in turn in terms of trying to conserve them mm. um but we have found solutions towards it so 100 well, percent. i think so <laughs> yeah it certainly sounds like you've had a lot of success Absolutely. just focusing on eggs and chicks how does that work with southern ground hornbills you know when they're raising them you know they they will get rid of a second egg or a second chick yeah so generally ground hornbills when they do breed they will lay two eggs most of the time they'll lay two eggs um, those eggs are laid about five days apart from each other and like they laid they also hatch about five days apart from each other so this means that actually when there's two chicks the one chick is considerably bigger than the other chick and what happens is that simply that the the smaller chick just gets outcompeted so it's, it's there's a big difference between the chicks the smaller one gets outcompeted and dies invariably in the wild um, there's there's no two ways about it we've tried supplementary feeding groups to see if they can raise two groups uh, two chicks mm -hmm. it, it didn't work it just doesn't change uh, one chick will always die so they can only produce one chick at maximum per year which is extremely low yeah. extremely low it's and such a, a lot slow of effort breeding rate goes into actually raising these chicks i yeah. mean the chicks they get very big inside of the nest so uh, i often explain it so uh, with actually with a lot of birds um their growth rate in the in at a young age is extremely rapid hmm. so ground hornbill chicks almost grow to full adult size in the first 60 days from hatching and considering that they live 50 to 60 years old it's like me growing to this size that i am this long tall slanky person <laughs> in the first 60 days and that's, that's me done for the rest of my life it is so it's, crazy it's it's super interesting but yeah they they make it a challenge but we we're getting there um <coughs> excuse me but uh, part of our conservation focus is because they lay these two eggs and the one chick always dies yeah before that chick dies yeah. we can actually we actually go and we take it out of the nest and then we've got a whole specialized ground hornbill rearing facility where these birds will be reared until about fledging age and then they'll actually be put with with ground hornbills and the ground horn and then with those adult ground hornbills they'll then learn how to do ground hornbill things essentially because we can we can you know you don't want to imprint on them you want them to learn how to forage you want them to learn how to preen you want them to learn how to have social behaviors all these things you want them to learn from other birds so we do this the birds kind of stay in this in the state with these with these captive birds for usually about a year or two and then we will artificially form groups and then release them into areas where they've disappeared from um, so essentially what we do what we're doing is just doubling the breeding success from these groups that we harvest from so it's it's been it's hugely awesome. successful and we're now starting to see actually these reintroduced groups are breeding on their own now which in terms of a reintroduction that is as, as successful as you can get really you want it's the amazing. birds to to be completely independent and just be ground hornbills essentially and it's it's a big challenge yeah and we've we've got it right which is fantastic that's really awesome car
mm. and must be so rewarding when that when you see those results. Absolutely, <coughs> it's a them. lot of work and a sure. lot of blood, sweat, and tears goes into this stuff. And when you see it actually working, it kind of it reminds you why why you do all this, why you actually put in those hours and things. It's fantastic, absolutely fantastic. That's very cool. Yeah, you 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 told me about this earlier that you know the timing is critical in going to go get that chick. Yeah. What is it? What is the timing on that? So usually when we harvest the chicks, we have to harvest them within the first three days of them hatching. If we get there and that chick is three or more days older, what happens is because the chick is starving, it's being outcompeted by the larger chick. That chick is starving and it starts to eat leaves usually. And then it's starting to eat leaves. So by the time we take it, no matter what we feed it, that stomach is compacted with leaves and it just, it dies. It's the, you know, it's getting no nutrients, plus nothing's passing through the system, so those chicks die. So the timing is absolutely critical for, for actually us to get, yeah. to get right at least. So yeah. thankfully we know, that, uh, we know where a lot of the nests are, mm. thanks to citizen science, a lot of the, the artificial nests that we use. Um, for those of you who don't know, we install a lot of artificial nests in the wild. It's a, often a limiting factor for the species. Um, this is just because of land use change, things like that. We'll actually, we make these artificial nests for the birds and then we go and we install them. And that's, this just gives them the opportunity to breed. Yeah. So thankfully because of this, we know where a lot of the nests are and we can actually monitor that breeding quite closely. We can go and check and say, okay, this group is laid in 40 days, which is usually the incubation period, this egg is gonna hatch. We will then go in and, and actually take it. So cool. Yeah. You touched on citizen science there, Kyle. How do people, how do people get involved in that? How do people share? I know what you want out of that. You mm. want people basically just to share where they're seeing birds, but also I think more critical where they're seeing nesting birds. How do they, how do they do that with Mabula? How do they get in touch with Absolutely. you? Absolutely. I mean, I can't, I can't overstate how important sightings from, from citizens are. It's, it goes such, such a long way for us. Yeah. Um, just kind of, so on your screen now you can see a kind of map. This map we created from a collection of sightings that we've gotten from Citizen Science and it just helps us ID where the birds are spending their time and then where nests might be. So the yellow areas are generally quite, they hot spots where the birds are spending time and then there's some green triangles on your screen there and those green triangles are, are actually nesting sites. So you can see the hot spots are usually around the nesting sites and this you know this is the whole reason why we want citizen science kind of thing it helps us keep track of the birds as well as find nests because nests are extremely difficult to find and yeah. the seven years that we've been doing it i think we've found five wow only five nests so it's extremely difficult and we need everyone yeah. and i mean ground hornbills occur everywhere from kenya to eastern cape in south africa kind of. yeah and for our relatively small team absolutely impossible to keep track of that many birds so it's it's massively valuable to us for for people to to just send in their sightings you know if you see a bird great please just send it through time location those are very important how many birds if you can sex them fantastic photos also go a massively long way mm. You know, all just these kinds of things. Even if you're seeing the same birds in the same location every single day, it yeah. helps us develop where those hot spots are and actually helps us identify potentially if there's a nest and just what areas are being favored and more importantly, what areas are being avoided. Yes. Because is, are they avoiding it for some specific reason? And if so, then we can get involved and find out what's going on and try and mitigate this. Yeah. Or it's maybe just a lack of us receiving citizen science sightings and then we can address that as well so yes it's, it's exactly. really it goes such such a long way for us such a long way yeah. well there you go everybody please reach out to carl reach out to mobula please uh, share any sightings that you have of southern ground hornbills whatever it may be we are gonna quickly jump to a short ad break everybody we'll be back with you shortly
Welcome back everybody. Uh, we were just chatting to Kyle about citizen science and sharing whatever sightings that uh, everybody out there does come across of the southern ground hornbills. Kyle, um, one thing we didn't touch on is how people actually share that information with yeah. you. So how do people get in touch with you? Definitely. I mean, you can you can contact us on all our social media platforms. You can contact, um, we've got a website, so you can go into the website, submit sightings. Bird lasso is a massive one. A lot of people, um, especially in South Africa, use bird lasso. So anything logged through bird lasso comes straight through us. And, and we actually get all those sightings. You just need to go and register and say that you support the Ground Hornwell Project. Um, Bird Pro is another app. Um, we start WhatsApp groups. So if you know of an area where you sometimes see ground hornbills, we're happy to start a little WhatsApp group. And, and then you can just kind of send your sightings through whenever you see the birds. And it's very easy. You can send a pin, number of birds. It keeps it very simple. There's very little chit chat. Um, I, I know a lot of people don't like WhatsApp groups. Yeah. We're on loads of them, so I understand. Um, but yeah, it's it really useful and goes goes a long, long way. And WhatsApp has is, is been a, a really good a game changer for us. Big time. Mm. <clears throat> Thanks, Carl. Um, the next thing I wanted to chat to you about is, you know, we, we obviously know that these these birds are, are struggling. I know you've obviously had a lot of yeah. success, but what are the numbers of southern ground hornbills specifically in South Africa, let's say? It's it's obvious it's always really difficult to, to sure. say numbers because especially with a bird that is occurs in such low densities and in really isolated locations. So yeah. we've we've been putting together data. So all these sightings that we get, we get for South Africa and for the whole of Southern Africa, and we can then build this this database and actually see how many birds there are. Um, in South Africa, the, it's always going to be an estimation. Sure. With, you know, with population stuff, we estimate that there's about 2,000 birds in South Africa, Ma wow. maximum, 2,000 birds. So. It's, it's really not a lot of birds, no, it's not a lot. Uh, and I know a lot of the time people see ground hornbills frequently within areas that they live in, and, and that's the, the reason why they ask, oh, but we see ground hornbills all the time. Yeah. You're seeing the same ground hornbill individuals every single time, so it's, it's yeah. not that they're doing well, it just means that one group is doing well and not necessarily the, the species as a whole. Yeah, large territories. Life and long span. lifespan. Long lifespan. So people are seeing the same birds. I've been That's doing this for seven years now, and I, I know that it's the same individual. We've started an individual ID kit, and it's the same individuals that we're working with. Unbelievable. Yeah. Eh? yeah. What, are, what are some of the biggest challenges that these birds face right now? What is What has led to the low numbers of the southern ground hornbill? So, like it's conservation, and unfortunately, everything conservation-based is is usually focused around anthropogenic reasons. So mm -hmm. humans are usually the issue. Um, there, there's several different factors. Land use change is a massive one. Mm. Um, obviously, people moving into an area, land use changes. Um, some of their, their nest sites get chopped down. Uh, things might, you know, turn into agriculture, for example, or something. Birds get chased away. Um, Persecution is a big issue, so I'm sure a lot of, uh, I'm sure you have, and I'm sure a lot of the viewers have seen, you know, like smaller birds that will see their reflection in windows, and they peck on windows. Ground hornbills are exactly the same. Yeah. They're territorial. They see their reflection in a window and they peck at it. But the difference is ground hornbills are big, massive. They're birds. about a meter tall, and they peck extremely hard. So when they peck, they break windows, and it, it can be a big issue. Mm. Um, I know a lot of people think, you know, oh, if you're living in this area where ground hornbills occur, you should expect it. But, it's, you know, we've had phone calls before, and, and people have phoned in and said they had 200 windows broken in a week. Gee and whiz. then you think about the cost factor Oof. and that effect that it, it reoccurs and things like that, and you kind of understand why, why that might happen. Yeah. Um, Poisoning is is always uh, like like vultures kind yeah. of thing. If ground hornbills are scavenging, um, but also with a poisoning, lead is is a big issue. So yeah. lead's something that we've brought up in you know in the past, Carl. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's there's obviously a lot of hunting that happens in South Africa, and absolutely, you know, <clears throat> hunting has its place. I I certainly mm -hmm. you know don't have a problem with 
a certain type of hunting. No, if it's, if it's done correctly, I think it's, yeah. I think it's extremely useful. And, and it's, a, it's, it's a management tool that we use on these reserves. Absolutely. It's just a reality. So, you know, we have to control our populations. Absolutely. So but, but the lead, the lead is the problem. So it's the lead ammunition. When something gets shot and the lead actually, the, the bullet actually impacts, it fragments. So it usually, you know, you can have one lead pellet, but when it fragments, it fragments into hundreds of tiny, tiny little pieces. Yeah. And ground hornbills are massively susceptible to this lead. Hmm. They have one fragment and they get lead poisoning and they die. So we, we're trying to figure out how to tackle this. We're not, we're not against hunting. We're just trying to see if there's alternatives. And there are alternatives. Um, we, it's always a matter of working with people and not against people. Sure. We're not working against the hunting community. We want no. to work with them and see if we can, we can find some kind of solution and, and you know, benefit everyone. Cause sure. It's, it's, and it's that, something that's transferable not only to ground hornbills. It's in vultures. It's an oh, issue. Geez, exactly. It's widespread. In humans, it's an issue. I mean, it's been you know. found before that uh, that you know people who tend to eat hunted meat yeah. have elevated levels of lead in their system and that can have all sorts of effects on yeah. on the human body and none of it good no exactly way. none of it good so it comes down to the ammunition uh, I don't know how much you know about it but how do you change that how do you change what people are using when they are hunting I mean is it is it just a specific type it's, of head that you use yeah on exactly. on your actual there's, round it's, it's that's what you've got to exactly, change exactly exactly okay. it's it's complicated because there's you know it's if you go really into the detail of it i'm not i'm by no means any kind of expert on this yeah but you know it's you're looking at flight trajectories you're looking at sure. impact i've spoken to someone and one of the issues often with alternatives is that when you shoot an animal it goes straight through yes and instead of actually having some kind of impact and and killing the animals so there are alternatives and things that really do work but yeah. then it also comes down to cost yeah. and it's, it's always a it's, factor there's always these factors that mm. and it's trying to break down break down the barriers because we're not like i said we're trying to work with people but as soon as you start talking about this kind of stuff people often go get into defen defensive mode and we d we don't want that no. we're not we're not trying to make people defensive we're oh, trying no. to figure out a solution for all exactly because at the end of the day, anyone who hunts realistically loves the bush. Correct. In, it's what it is. They love the yeah. bush. They love being outside. Love, love being outdoors, yeah. Exactly. And yeah. It's, it's not that they want to just kill everything. They want to... Yeah. And we, we need to figure it out. Yeah, well, it's a very interesting topic. Mm. Um, hot topic. Yeah, a hot topic. Controversial of topic. The one that I, 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 I personally uh, enjoy discussing with people from all different parts. Mm. Um, it is it is something that we can definitely change if yeah. we all just talk about it and get more involved with it. Yeah. You and I spoke earlier about predation of southern ground hornbills, and I found it fascinating what you were telling us about. Obviously, you know you, we've spoken about what man does to southern yeah. ground hornbills. What happens naturally to these birds as well, in your experience over the last seven years? Over the past seven years, I mean, we put up camera traps up at all of these nests, so we we have a good understanding of what's happening with the birds, why, yeah. why they might be failing, and things like that. If they are nesting, yeah. leopards were always presumed to be an issue, and they they are an issue. Well, not an issue, but they are a reason why predation events happen, and that's that's natural. Mm. But actually, what we find is that genets are are the more often than not they are the main culprits for a nesting attempt failing. That's unbelievable. You I think no a genet is much smaller than a ground hornbill, yeah. but we've we've caught them on camera before actually sneak attacking. You know, a chick which is almost ready to fledge. It was soul destroying. This chick was three, four days away from fledging and leaving the nest, and a genet came in, saw the, saw the bird was sleeping, and just pounced on it crazy i had no idea yeah. absolutely no idea that a genet was a threat yeah and it's always one of these things that you presume that we always presumed leopard were an issue yeah but now we can see that genets are and other predators an what other predators of lion do they ever go for them i don't Cheetah? think they would have they would have gone for adult birds walking yeah but in terms of breeding groups yeah, it's mainly genus, but definitely the the adults walking through it would have been lion, cheetah, mm -hmm. crocodile. Have we, yeah, we, sure. We, I mean, crocodile, like prehistoric creatures. They'll take anything. Eh? Pythons at nest sites. Pythons, 
it's a weird one. We haven't caught anything. We've we've definitely found pythons inside of nests before, uh -huh. which is you know you, it's the last thing you want to see when yeah, you stick your sure. head inside of a tree canopy. <laughs> Not fun. We actually had one. This is a bit of a sidetrack, but we had one nest the one time when we we were there were must have been four of us. Each of us stuck our heads inside this nest, and we we're like, "Oh, nest is empty, but super interesting." Later that day, Carrie, my wife, got back and she was going through the photos that we took and she said, oh, when was this python in the nest? <laughs> <laughs> All of us stuck our heads in there because it's dark inside there. That python was just curled up in the corner. Big one. Not massive, not maybe a meter. Amazing. But I mean, yeah, just sneakily in the corner there. Crazy Could have gone stuff. wrong. Very Crazy quickly. stuff. Yeah. All right, everybody. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna quickly jump to a short ad break. We'll be back with you again shortly. Dear future filmmakers, Africa is calling. It's time to reawaken your wild. Painted Dog TV is offering an internship unlike any other. Join our pack and see the world through a whole new lens. Live and work in the beating heart of the South African bush and become part of our mission to share it with the world. For the love of wildlife. For the storytellers of our future. Painted Dog TV Internships. Hello everybody, welcome back. Uh, before Carl and I get into uh, some more conversations about the Southern Ground Hornbills. I just wanted to quickly remind all of our viewers, please send through your questions. If anybody have, any of you have any questions for Carl or myself, uh, please start sending those through so that we can uh, tackle that a little bit later in the show. Uh, right, um, Carl, I wanted to ask you some more questions more specifically to the bird's diet. What, what, what is it that Southern Ground Hornbills feed on, on, on a regular basis? They so have they, an amazing diet. They, yeah, they do have an amazing diet and it's often stuff we get asked about a lot. Yeah. Um, so they're generalists, so they'll pretty much eat anything that they can overpower, essentially. So this, you know, they eat the whole animal, so they're technically fornivorous. Okay. So rather than a carnivore just eating meat, they're just gonna eat bones and all kind of thing. And this includes, you know, a lot of their diet is made up of invertebrates, so a lot mm. of a lot of insects, a lot of spiders, a lot of random centipedes and things like that. Yeah. But then they also go for a lot of lizards, a lot of snakes, a lot of chameleons. Um, tortoises are often the most famous one that they're known for for eating. They yeah. they like to tip tortoises on their sides and and then kind of eat them from this from their legs, which is it's gruesome to see, but it's interesting nonetheless of course it is, yeah. it's nature nature yeah. is gruesome fascinating absolutely but we've even got like i mentioned they're fornivorous we've seen we've got footage of ground hornbills eating tortoises whole kind of so shell and all down the hatchet done kind of thing so it's <laughs> that's nuts so. they'll pretty much eat anything they eat a lot of they eat mammals as well yep. scrub hairs they yep. i've seen them eating scrub hairs scrub quite regularly like mad they yep. love a good scrub hair and crazy yeah vicious and you know you wonder why how rather ground hornbills will catch a scrub hair scrub hair is very agile and and nimble but rodents too i've rodents, seen them feeding on rodents yep. and those things also like lightning but they fast. work together i mean they work when they walk through the bush, they often kind of walk in a 
phalanx kind of thing so they walk together and as soon as one some spots some kind of food they all pounce on it and they all chase and they work together and it's amazing to see they pack hunters essentially yeah. cooperative breeders i mean it's amazing to, to see yeah. them work together like that yeah absolutely yeah. it's it's fantastic and <clears> even <throat> even um, we mentioned earlier that the genets eat eat the birds the birds eat the genets well. yeah no problem yeah i bet no. they'd have no problem with that no yeah those beaks are powerful what's yeah. one of the craziest things that you've ever come across a bird feeding on oh i would say not so much the craziest thing the quantity of, of things and and how they find them like chameleons i mean oh they smash chameleons a ground hornbill's eyes are so adept to to finding chameleons it is it is impressive you know you mm. see them walking through the bush they slow and they walk next to any kind of bush and all of a sudden they glance up like this and they instantly see the chameleons and jump up at them and how i don't know i mean a chameleons obviously evolved to to be camouflaged but yeah. the ground hornbills have just found a way around it and Really I've can. seen them do that. It's yeah. it blows your mind. I mean, it, you, I I cannot find a chameleon during the day. Just by the yeah. way, everybody, I don't think I ever have in 14 yeah. years of guiding. Uh, we we find them a lot at night, and yeah, those yeah. birds are amazing at finding them. Absolutely, it truly is Absolutely something incredible. else. Eh? Kyle, tell us uh, more about Mabula itself, your organisation that you work for. Yeah. Uh, obviously, Southern Ground Hornbills is something that you guys focus on, but what else is there? What is the depth to the organisation? Yeah, so we are, we are very much, it's Mabula Ground Hornbill Project, and we are exclusively focused on, on ground hornbills themselves. So it's one of the species that we have identified and we are going to help. So we've spoken a, few, a bit about artificial nests mm -hmm. and the kind of reintroductions and the harvesting and things, but there's, there's much more to, to the project than that. I mean, we do a lot of actual research on the species. So I always like to say that good conservation is based off good research yeah. kind of thing. Because you, you can go into something and just, you know, go guns blazing. But if you don't know how the species operates and what works and what doesn't, it's not going to work. So we do a lot of research. Um, this is on the chicks, on the adults. We do research on climate change. You know, is climate change actually affecting affecting these chicks? Um, we, have, we have a whole bunch of different programs where we try and address the the window breakages issue um, we have a whole education side of things which which we try and tackle so like with all conservation one of the main issues is just knowledge of yeah. people and we're yeah. just trying to you know share not just the, the troubles that ground hornbills are facing but as a whole conservation what people can do and just educate them that ground hornbills are, are struggling and and that kind of thing and and also trying to bring up future conservationists so part of our, our our main thing at, at Mobula is that you know we want people to come through the system but we don't want like with a lot of conservation so it's things people come in and then they disappear and actually leave the industry which is the last thing conservation needs yeah. we need people in the industry with those skills so it's Mobula is tackling all these things it's based off six pillars pretty much it's research monitoring the birds which are mentioned which is the citizen science yeah. mitigation which is trying to tackle the threats that the that the birds are facing um restoring so with this is the reintroduction programs and things like that then we have the um sorry i've gone blank now that's okay then we have the education and then the improvement so it's it's these six pillars which which mabula is really is really focused on in order to you know help the species and the species is definitely you know we can help them we are helping them it's just a matter of time and we yeah. just need to we need to somehow slow this decline in the species and then reverse that decline mm -hmm. before they go extinct because like we mentioned they long live species so for example if they're living in an area and you remove their nest that group is likely to stay in that area for 50 years up to 50 years and then just suddenly disappear so it's this lag effect that we have with ground hornbills rather than the effects often happening immediately yeah. there's also this lag effect that we need to we need to tackle and it's it's solvable it's definitely solvable oh it's amazing you touched on uh, briefly now the the nest boxes that you put up mm. can you can you tell us a bit more about that I, I, you know you know i spoke earlier i've i've seen a couple of these boxes in my time throughout the different properties I've worked on. 
tell us about uh, what sort of boxes you're using yeah. and the success rate and the, and the time and how that all works with these, these the, artificial nests. The nest boxes were, were fantastic when they were initially installed. People just thought, well, we don't think these birds have any nests, let's put one up. Uh -huh. And I mean, that was 20, even 30 years ago, probably. Um, and those nest boxes have just evolved, constantly evolving because the ground hornbills like to break things. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I think there, there might be a video of a ground hornbill breaking a camera. Yeah, um, they are destructive. They're very destructive <laughs> and they unfortunately break their own nests and then, you know, they peck at everything, they test the integrity of it. So we shifted to, you know, nests that are really strong mm -hmm. and that, you know, will be ground hornbill proof. Yeah. Much. And they've worked and they've been a massive success. Um, we want to put we don't want to have to go and put nests up and then replace them every two three years We want to put a nest up and say that is a ground humble nest for the next 20 30 40 50 years Yeah, you know as minimal, you know, we want to maximize our effort kind of thing Yeah, but we've also found that actually with these with these nests that the temperatures inside the nests actually play a big role as well because like with a lot of other birds um if it's really hot inside there, that chick is going to have to thermoregulate itself mm. and it's going to be using a lot of energy to do that. If it's panting, it's using, losing a lot of moisture, um, crucial moisture in an area like this. Yeah. Um, and those chicks can actually be smaller. Okay. So we are constantly evolving these nests to figure this, figure this problem out to make them durable, but not, you know, not an oven pretty much so we've got a variety of different nests we've got really durable nests now uh, which have been absolutely fantastic mm -hmm. we've got research nests which are focusing more specifically on the research side of things so we've got little compartments where we can we haven't got there yet but that we can actually eventually install internal cameras inside the nest and see what's going on inside of the nest we want to make scales that it can attach to them so it's very exciting. The nests have been definitely one of the one of the, the big successes of, of the conservation of the species and, so and cool. it's working. And like Kruger and much of this, this area around Kruger is doing really well with birds breeding in artificial nests. So what we want to do is now use these artificial nests and put them in the outskirts. So we want birds to disperse naturally out of these areas that are doing well to kind of promote natural dispersal. So okay. generally when ground hornbills disperse, they'll break away from their, their natal group and they'll wander around on their own for a bit. Yeah. Most of the time they find no breeding opportunities because it's, it's you know, the chances are slim of finding a mate or a nest. Sure. But when they do find a nest, they either tend to anchor to those nests and repopulate an area already and wait for a mate, or they'll at least remember where the nests are and then constantly revisit them. Okay. So it's just, it's slow, it's very slow, yeah. but it's working. Yeah. And we just want to carry on doing that so that we hopefully will reap the benefits in 20 years time when areas are repopulated. It truly is awesome mm. stuff that. What is, what do, what do these boxes cost? I, I mean, I know there's so many different types yeah. of boxes that you put up, but just like Ballpark figure, what, you know, what what are you looking at in terms Ballpark of putting up? Ballpark figure, materials, the construction, cost, transport. transport. Yeah. It's usually about ten thousand rand per nest. <laughs> yeah, it's like yeah. It. yeah, it's a good chunk of change. It's a, it's a good chunk of change. Yeah. So it's not just blood, sweat, and tears, everybody. Uh, it 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 yeah, it's not cheap either. No, no, awesome. Thank you, Carl, for sharing that with us. We are going to head to a short ad break, everybody. We'll be back with you again soon.
very spoilt here on the Ritz Break Reserve. How awesome is that, guys? Right past the front of our truck. Look at that, everybody. They are just unreal. Welcome back everybody. Uh, before I forget, I just wanted to quickly remind everybody uh, we're all very excited about remembering leopards, of course, and uh, there's going to be an amazing event happening here in Hootspreit on the 15th of this month, which Brent will be hosting. Uh, so for all of you that are interested in remembering leopards, please just pencil that date in. And for those of you that haven't purchased this amazing book yet, please look it up and uh, support, support this amazing project and get yourself this incredible book which is just filled with some of the most amazing photographs of my favorite favorite animal all righty uh kyle it's Gr ground horn is not your favorite animal hey listen i absolutely <laughs> love them but but leopards win leopards win for me hands down love them all uh and yeah thank you thank you kyle oh. it's it's been so wonderful having you on the show and and chatting about it all um thanks we, for having me no of course and and certainly take our hat off to you guys and what you do um one thing i i wanted to quickly say is you know we at painted dog always want to try and help and get involved and, mm. and something that we've recently seen that's popped up here on our reserve at the reed game reserve are some southern ground yep. hornbills um so that's really exciting um, can you maybe just tell us quickly a little bit about that group? I know I don't know how much you know about this group, but they were seen recently on the reserve, the eastern part of the reserve. Yeah, literally it's kicked off in the past week. It's kicked off properly with this group. It's very exciting. Um, I think they've moved in from one of the neighboring reserves and they had a nest there last year and they bred successfully. So this group actually has a really young juvenile in it, which is absolutely fantastic. I mean, you can spot it from a mile away. It's pale throat. They're not the smartest when they're out, when they're that young, they, <laughs> yeah. they don't know what's potting, so yeah. yeah. No, very, really very cool. cool. Very, very excited to see how that plays out yeah. with, with, you know, birds that are close to home for us here uh, on the Reed Sprague Game Reserve, everybody here at Painted Dog. Um, but yeah, again, thank you, Carl, for, for coming to join us, bud. Uh, it's Thanks really, really me. awesome to see what you guys are up to and, and for all of you watching, um, get involved, become citizen scientists and uh, tell us about all of the amazing Southern Ground Hornbill sightings yeah. that you have. Uh, it will certainly help everybody. All right, everybody. So the next little bit that we go into is also a very exciting part of the show. We're going to go into our viewers' photos and videos. Very excited to have a look at these with Carl. Mm. And I believe that the first image that we're looking at is of a bird of prey, a vulture from Liz Wolf. Liz, thank you so much for sending through your image, uh, which I believe you took on thorny bush this year. Looks like a hooded vulture. Uh, yeah. That truly is an amazing photograph. You've captured awesome. it perfectly. Obviously also one of our critically endangered species. That's a beautiful photograph. Um, yeah, I've actually just seen some of them here recently on the Reed Sprat Game Reserve as well. That, that, those highlights that we were showing you with the wild dogs feeding. Uh, we had some of those birds turn up at that carcass as well. So thank you, Liz. Thank you for sharing that with us. Going into the next photograph, this is from one of our good friends. Michael Fleetwood has sent in an image of a spotted hyena, which he said was eyeing a zebra kill guarded by lions on Biffle's Hook. A uh, very cool shot there. Um, here's to be... Quite a mature spotted hyena, possibly a female judging by its size. Great shot there, Michael. I see that you've also made a comment. 
uh, or hoping for a den on the reed spray soon. Yeah, that, that's 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 always exciting. That is exciting. Yeah. We've we've struggled with the hyenas here, uh, thanks to oh, really? thanks to the lions. Yeah, they've, I think they've been denning on sunspray actually, to be okay. honest. So there's still a lot of spotted hyena activity on yeah. the reserve, as well as brown hyena, which is ridiculous when you consider the fact really? that there's brown hyena in this area. Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah, there's brown hyena seen so here on Reed Spray and on Madrid. Hyena, hyenas are underrated animals. Oh, I love them. Yeah, they are fantastic. Absolutely love them. Yeah. But yeah, so Michael, hopefully, fingers crossed, they'll come back and den here on the Reed Spray Game Reserve. Right, going into the next photograph, this is from Daniel Hammond. Nice. A photograph of a beautiful male lion. Um, Mark, uh, sorry, Daniel has said that it's a photo of one of the Gomondwan males in the Kruger Park a good few years back. I don't, I don't know this particular male. I don't know that particular coalition, but it truly is a stunning photograph. I love the fact that it's in black and white, and he's looking up. I wonder if he was watching some vultures at the time. Uh, a really, really awesome shot. Thank you so much for sending that through to us. Moving on to the next photograph, or photographs. Um, I think this is our last one. This comes from the, the wonderful Cecilia Muller. Thank you so much for sending this through. You see you've got two images of two different species of moth here. Um, beautiful photographs, beautiful moths. The one on the right being one of my favorites, that's for sure, the African moon moth. Uh, which you took at Intari's bush camp in the Khriki Private Nature Reserve. And you've, you've said that the one on the left is the exclamation moth. Now, I don't know, Kyle, what you think. I, I don't recognize that moth species uh, on the left. That's definitely not one that you see often, that's yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's, that's a really awesome moth species. And I can't wait to actually do a little bit more research there, to be honest, Cecilia. I've never seen that moth species before. Mm. So... Not too sure which one it is. I'll get home tonight and straight to the books. Yeah, a little bit of homework for you and I when we get back home. Uh, but thank you so much for sending your photographs through, everybody. We really do appreciate it. And uh, please keep sending them in. Um, it's awesome, awesome to see what you guys get up to. Right, I believe, Vim, are we going to an ad break now or are we going straight into questions? Oh, fantastic. All right, everybody. So, we are going to go straight into our Q&A section now, and I believe that some of our PAC members had, have sent some questions through to us. I'm just going to pull this up Fantastic. really quick. Oh, are we going to oh, break? Oh, wow. Quiet, quiet, Gareth. Calm down. All right. Hello, everybody. Here's all our followers here, Carl. All our trusted PAC members. Hello, everybody. Hello, Barbara. Hello, Mary. Hello, Carol. Uh, hello, Becky. Hello, Michael. So good to have you with us, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us and, and sending through some of the questions. Um, just give me a sec while I scroll back up here. Are those bats flying around after insects, Michael asks. To be honest with you, I've been too focused on Kyle's beautiful face <laughs> and the camera that I haven't noticed what's been flying around behind me. I have not seen a bat yet. No, no, no. no. Uh, right. Who's next? Mary's asked the question, Kyle, will the female ground hornbill have a chosen male of the group or is it a kind of harem situation? So there's definitely a, a dominant male and a dominant uh, female within the group. Yeah. Amazing. Eh? And they'll spend, yeah, closer to breeding season, they'll kind of spend most of their time together. And uh, yeah, it's definitely, there's an alpha. The rest of the group is usually made up of family members, so offspring from previous broods. So mm -hmm. most of the time there's, there's the alpha pair, but they don't necessarily mate for life. Okay. It's often something that's thought of because they're slow and they live for so long, but they do switch out partners every now and then. Interesting. Yeah. Be interested to know how that how that all works. I suppose it's quite difficult to track yeah, how that works. It's eh? only something we're starting to see now in the past three four years. So it's, okay, it's very very fresh. Amazing. Yeah, very good question there, Mary. Thank you. Mm. Michael's asked the question here: In non-artificial breeding groups in the wild, what factors determine dispersal of older offspring, and have you tracked the dispersal distance of these individuals? Dispersal is a tricky thing. We have not had much success with fitting tracking devices onto any kinds of birds. Yeah. Um, the females usually disperse much, much younger than, than males because every group has only got a single female within the group. 
generally females if you know if a juvenile female she usually gets kicked out of the group within a year or two sure. of hatching wow. whereas the males live the dream really they can just they can stay for as long as they want i think we've got offspring that have stuck around with their parents much like humans i'm sure but they've stuck around with their parents <laughs> for 30 years kind of thing so. yeah um, in terms of distance, it's it's really really difficult to stay to say, and we we don't have a lot of information on that yet. Hopefully, hopefully soon, but at the moment there's there's not a great deal on distances. Okay, interesting. We do. I mean, the birds disperse vast distances. I mean, we've got records of birds dispersing and starting new groups. You know, a hundred kilometers away, kind of thing. So they they travel and they just wander around on their own, mm. often for extended periods of time okay mm. very interesting um, there's another question here from Africa sky when they are not breeding do they stay around the nest areas no so they don't during the breeding they're obviously going to stick around the nest and it's yeah. very much a scent point yeah um, during which time their territories actually contract a little bit because they you know they're pinging to and from the nest constantly mm -hmm. but outside of the breeding season they're using the full extent of their territories and their home range so often they will travel to to much further distances and it's yeah i could get very theoretical with this stuff but it may be a reason why we see birds not always reusing the same nest year on year on year in year out they actually shift and i think their territories this is this is very anecdotal and speculative, but I think their territories are very liquid. Okay. Because they, they advertise and defend their territories mostly through vocalizations. Mm -hmm. So I think when they, it depends on where their neighbors are, the neighboring territories are and what they can hear from their neighbors. So if they move into an area where there's nothing, they'll probably just carry on going. But I think that if, if they're moving and then all of a sudden they start hearing birds, I think they tend to stop then and yeah. start moving back. But like I mentioned, this is very speculative and it's just from, it's my educated guess after, after seven years of actually studying their territorial behaviors and things like that. It's very cool. Mm. It's a very interesting angle. Uh, all right. Uh, I think we've run out of questions, everybody. Thank you to those who have sent in some really awesome questions. Uh, we're very grateful to you. Um, and very grateful to you, Carl. Oh, um, I again, think we'll, thanks. I think we'll probably leave it at that for the evening in terms of the Q and A. But yeah, once again, thanks, bud. Thanks, Happy to have thanks you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, hopefully we'll see you around here soon. Oh, yeah. I'm around. No, no, <laughs> we know you're always around. But yeah, Don't get rid of me. <laughs> no, no, no ways. But uh, yeah, hopefully we'll we'll uh, we'll be spending some time with you with, like I say, with that group of birds that are on property at the moment. Absolutely. But and yeah. if anyone's got questions that they, you know, just later stage, they feel free to contact me and I'll answer them as best I can. <laughs> when you're available. Yeah. yeah. How yeah. do we contact you? The best is to go onto Mabula Ground Humble Project website and then there will be loads of contact details there. Um, mm -hmm. I will be there. My email address is lofelt at groundhornball.org.za. Um, please. Call me, phone me, whatever, any time of the day. I love talking ground hornbill. I could get real deep. <laughs> let's, let's do it. Let's get weird. <laughs> and of course, your social media as well. I suppose yes, everybody can find you, obviously. Social media, social media is such a Always, big thing, so yeah. people can find you that way. Massive, yeah. Uh, no, awesome. Thanks, Carl. Uh, just wanted to also quickly say a big thank you to all of our sponsors. Uh, that sponsor, Painted Dog, thank you to Rogue, thank you to Led Lenza, uh, thank you to Dunlop, I think I've got them all. Oh, and Stanley, sorry, Stanley, thank you, Stanley, thank you very much. And thank you to all of you, everybody, thank you so much for joining us tonight on That's Wild, it's been an awesome show, uh, yeah, a lot of fun talking about such a special bird. Yeah. We'll see you soon, everybody, have a wonderful evening.
at the top of a mountain. Oh, look at this. <laughs> Pouring with rain. Oh no, look at that. Oh no. ESCOM, this is like an abandoned, abandoned installation with lots of antennas and that. I mean, look at that tower. Holy moly. But otherwise, look at that view. Oh yes. Missions to get you, but holy smokes, what a treat. Not bad. <laughs> video. You video. Yes. Here we are. <laughs> Alright. Yeah.